morning everyone today i am going to uh, introduce you uh, module number 2 part 2 introduction of computer and programming in c so here we left the portion software so we have already discussed uh, three different kind of software like system software utility software and application software so after that now come to another part of computer this is part of computer so what is inside that computer part okay so uh, this is network and internet and it is very important nowadays without network and internet computer is nothing so without internet you uh, are not able to operate in computer also so the networks are there then the internet and the social networking so there are three different type of thing associated with networks so in the in case of internet we use internet for communicate like ms team we are using okay whatsapp call <laughs> is coming under social media ms team cisco webex okay and so many other uh, protocols are there which is used for communication uh, communication between uh, two users or some parties now research and access information you can nowadays research is totally dependent on internet you just need to search whether corona vaccine is available covid vaccine is available or not you are not going to rely on any other source you just search for internet so research and different access informations are available in the internet then come to shop online so there are varieties of shopping websites you can see here some of them i had quoted like mintra snapdeal shop clues local bhaiya baniya uh, first cry infibeam infibeam to band ho gayi hai home shop 18 it is almost closed flipkart amazon and jabong there are varieties of uh, uh, number of shop and other than these are farmers pride okay farmers pride this site is dedicated for organic product and so many other sites are there then come to trading so trading websites are very popular uh, different different trading like uh, paisabazaar.com and some other trading websites are available then banking and investment like bank of riyadh am bank group hsbc proxy yes slide nahi dikh rahi slide is not visible first wali dikh rahi hai met school of engineering and technology okay 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 fine yes fine. Fine. This much is sufficient. Okay. I think it is visible to all now. Fine. Yes, sir. So these are the different different sites associated with shopping. Fine. Then trading. Uh, online trading dot com and other sites are also there. Then bank and investment like Federal Bank, Bank of India, State Bank of India. So many banks are there. Then come to entertainment. So like uh, different entertainment, Hotstar dot com. Okay. Then uh, many uh, of the entertainment sites are available. YouTube and um, so many. fine download music to download music also sites are available like uh, gana.com saavn.com etc then if you want to share video then youtube is there and beside youtube several other platforms are also available to share your videos download music already told you web applications different web applications you can develop and you can upload it like blogging and some other web applications are available now come to third form of internet is social networking so social networking includes facebook instagram whatsapp they the they are a uh, different different kind of network like in whatsapp you can directly chat with your uh, friends using phone numbers in instagram you are sending images and videos uploading images and videos and your network is also going there and facebook is actually it is uh, day by day face uh, book of face so so many uh, uh, networking things are there and linkedin and 
professional uh, uh, social networking, professional networking sites like LinkedIn is also available. So you can see that without internet, you cannot able to do anything. And here using internet, IoT is also working. IoT is a platform which is used for smart home and smart office. OK, you can control your office from here and you can control your home from here. So these are uh, things associated with network and Internet. Different applications in society like in education domain, you can see finance, government, healthcare, science, publishing, travel and manufacturing. So here uh, for education, different sites I had shown here like Admodo, in, uh, Instructure, uh, DS Complica, Simply Learn, Topper, Scholar, Udemy, and Quota um, Factory, you know, there are uh, applications. Unacademy, yes. Unacademy is also available. So these are associated with uh, education. Then finance, financial websites, government like nic.gov.in. For healthcare, uh, doctors.com, Okay, and wellness is also there. ISRO, NASA, IEEE. These are the website associated with science and technology for publishing. Like you want to publish your blog, and if you want to public publish your book, then Pratilipi is there. Pratilipi. Okay, and. Uh, so many other sites are there because I had not explored. If you want, if you go inside the Internet, many of the sites available where you can publish your blog for blogging. I use blogspot.com. OK, then professional blogging. There is mode. Then uh, um, uh, mode and uh, one more medium. These are the famous blogging site and these are premium blogging site. It means if you want to blog here, you need to pay something for travel, Expedia, Cleartip, Mushafir, Go IBO. These are the websites and for manufacturing uh, sites, multiple manufacturing sites are available. OK, so this is application in society of computer. Using computer. What are the, the advantages if you use computer? So it gives tremendous speed to calculate. It is reliable means the information like one plus one is always two. OK, in some times what happen if you ask any person? So the answer is uh, sometimes it is correct. It is not correct. Consistency means whatever uh, it, it, it gives consistent performance storage. Tremendous storage is there. Tremendous storage actually in human brain is also tremendous storage available, but you cannot recall at the desired time. Like in examination time, you sometimes every everybody knows what is the concept behind that particular question, but during examination you won't be able to recall these things. So tremendous storage, there is no meaning of that. But in computer, if you store all these data, you can uh, access the data. Then communication. So using a computer, you can communicate other people with each other through social media and some other sites are also available. Disadvantages if permanently you are residing, uh, you are uh, um, in front of computer, then there may be damage of your, there may be chances of damage of your eyes and uh, some other associated uh, health risks are also there. OK. Then if you are using this uh, internet, I am uh, recording this video. Your video is uh, recorded here. Your uh, faces are recorded here. So this is definitely violation of privacy and that's why team shows one message that uh, whether you want to be recorded or not. OK, then public safety is there uh, because each and every information is associated with the computer and you store your password. In uh, before a computer era, you need to go for a particular bank branch and then fill the form and then take the money. Nowadays, what happened? You are sitting in front of computer, just typing, just opening the internet website and just typing the password and it will automatically 
send or uh, uh, you can send the money to particular person and you can receive from uh, receive money from particular person okay this is one thing this is advantage but the disadvantage is that whenever you are using public computer and there is a program called keylogger keylogger always checks uh, it is always checking for uh, means uh, what are the key that is placed by user so on the basis of these key the uh, hacker understand that uh, the name of person is suppose kapil and the password is suppose met123 okay so this is the password so one can easily understand that this is the uh, name and this is the password so this can be uh, very it violates the public safety and there are ways of violating public safety impact on labor force so it is said that um, due to computer labor is uh, um, means uh, labor force is not available to do work so it is uh, totally false because uh, the persons are struggling for labor force due to computer uh, labor force is not easily available okay be be before this labor force was easily available impact on environment because each and everything is in the form of electricity okay electricity or optics so that's why it uh, impacts large whenever electricity is used it will automatically uh, increases your carbon dioxide or carbon footprint okay so uh, these are the advantages and disadvantages of computer let us now talk about computer history so up to this it was fundamental of computer what is computer and the answer related with computer now computer history so first computer was a backers okay in fourth century before christ the backers a simple counting ad may have been invented in babylonia now it is in iraq in the fourth century before christ this device allows user to make computations using system of sliding beads so these are the sliding beads and uh, now what is the backers classes are also very popular due to this and considered the first computer so and then come to in 1623 between 1623 to 1662 in uh, uh, 1642 the french mathematician and philosopher blaise pascal invented a calculating device that that would come to be called the adding machine okay so this was the adding machine and i will show you how it works on the first and earliest mechanical device used for calculating was pascaline in the name of the, uh, pascal and there was a language also in honor of pascal so this language is pascal it is originally called a numerical wheel calculator so here you can see that a numerical wheel is there and we are going to calculate 56 plus 78 so initially we set 5 and then we will going to set 6 okay so let me pause this okay yeah so uh pascaline so pascal's invention utilize a train of eight movable wheel 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 so this is original pascal machine fine and uh, dials or cogs to add sum of eight figures long as one dial turn 10 notches or a complete revolution it mechanically turn to the next dial so this is a fundamental pascal's mechanical adding machine automated the process of calculation although it is uh, slow by modern standard this machine did uh, provide a fair degree of accuracy and speed so only performed addition not multiplication or division so this is the disadvantage of this machine but addition also it it, it starts addition so let us see 
so this is the answer okay and in, now finally we need to set it to 0 0 0 okay then this was the computer very fast computer okay although it is uh, developed for uh, something else so got it fried willem von leibniz leibniz theorem you have heard about this so the stepper rockner uh, rackoner supposed to be able to add subtract multiply divide and calculate square roots but this device never worked properly because of mechanical alignment here in the uh, left hand side you can see that this device is aligned like this and he is the fellow who has developed this uh, machine so let me show you how this works If you want to multiply 7 multiplied by 5, then just set this gear to 7 and move this uh, handle 5 times. So this will give you 35 here you can see that this gives you 35 okay so this is the machine developed by Lebanese okay and it is uh, known as first mechanical calculator but it uh, it won't work uh, accurately that time then Charles Babbage in 1791 he is considered the father of computers born in 1791 he was an English mathematician and professor. In 1822, he persuaded the British government to finance his design to build a math uh, machine that would calculate tables of logarithms called difference engine. OK, so this device was to calculate numbers to 28th place and print them at four digit per minute. Fine. So here you can see this machine. With Charles Babbage's creation of analytical engine 1833, uh, computers took the form of general purpose machine. So this is the analytical machine engine here in the left hand side and this is a difference engine. OK, so this is a working difference engine. So here you can see that numbers are rolling. So later in 1833 also, he has developed an analytical engine used to perform a variety of calculations by following a set of instructions or programs stored on punch card. This machine was designed but never built. Okay, only pr pr prototype uh, was available. But this is the printing port of this machine, difference engine. Here you can print the result. Okay, that time monitor was not there but printing mechanism was there. So this was the machine. Later, Joseph Jacquard, uh, Joseph Jacquard, uh, he is uh, uh, actually, he has uh, designed a, a prototype for uh, uh, looms okay so in his loom uh, he used punch card okay on the basis of punch card it is like omr sheet okay omr sheet so he used to read his machine used to read this information and then it will work 
so let us see uh, what is the creation and after that model computer takes uh, uh, this is a mechanical jacquard loom this technology was developed in France in 1803 by a weaver named Joseph Marie Jacquard. The key thing about this loom is that it controls every warp thread, the threads that go from the front to the back of the loom, individually. Because it can do that, the loom can create very complex fancy patterns in the cloth more quickly and with greater accuracy than the technology available before this loom was developed. These cards are what carry the instructions that are read by the apparatus on the second floor that tells the loom what pattern to create. The holes in the cards are read by a series of pins up in the apparatus, and those holes tell the apparatus which threads down here should be raised for each pass of my shuttle across the warp. Some of you might recognize these cards as looking similar to computer punch cards. Back in the early days of computer technology, punch cards carry the instructions that told the early computers what kind of calculations to do. So this loom is the great, great, great grandfather of the computer technology that we all use today. And that technology started with a machine that produces cloth. So here it shows the process of designing a punch card and how these are uh, programmed for looms, okay? So these are punch card are nothing but programming card, okay? So uh, these holes uh, gives certain instruction to the machine and machine will follow the instruction and then it will uh, design the looms. So this was a uh, very first invention and this was the motivation to design punch card and computer, okay? So then come to first computer program, uh, programmer. She was uh, Ada Baron Countess of Lovelace, okay? And she was worked with uh, uh, Charles Babbage. So let us uh, see uh, something about her. History who's who. Welcome to History Who's Who. Who is Ada Lovelace? Ada Lovelace was an English mathematician and scientist and was born on the 10th of November, 1815. Her full name is actually Augusta Ada King Noel, Countess of Lovelace. She is now thought to be one of the pioneers of early computers. As a young girl, she was fascinated with maths and science, and at 17 years old, she met a man called Charles Babbage, who had designed a cogwheel calculating machine. Ada was amazed by the model that he had made, and they soon became good friends. In 1834, Charles Babbage began work on another more elaborate computer called the Analytical Engine, and it had been thought that Ada only had a small part to play in the design. However, modern research has now suggested that Ada played a huge part in designing and writing the programs for the machine. But neither Ada or Charles Babbage ever saw it working in their lifetime. Ada died aged 36 on November the 27th, 1852. The full-size working machine from the designs of Ada and Charles were not made until 2002 by a team of scientists at the London Science Museum. Ada is now regarded as the first ever computer programmer, and that's Ada Lovelace. So she's Ada Lovelace, first computer programmer. Okay, then come to tabulating machine. So, <coughs> sorry, what is the, uh, actually tabulating machine was developed uh, for US census. Uh, uh, what is the uh, thing behind US census? US census, like in India, it uh, done every 10 years, process uh, done by hand in 19th century. It took 10 years to complete until Holrith's punch card. So Holrith has developed this uh, punch card, okay? So Herman Holrith, 
or Holrich's punch card will be. Uh, he he has developed this punch card machine. It uses electricity rather than mechanical gears. So before this, every computer uses mechanical gears, holes representing information to be tabulated where punch in card. Okay, because we can automate. Uh, we can uh, either transfer the uh, electric charges through these holes, or we can transfer the light also. Okay, so in case of OMR. we transfer the light and in case of this punch card there is a drum and over this drum it is placed and uh, another drum is coming if we rotate it so automatically particular portion get contacted so on the basis of this it will read the information okay so like the location because we are talking about uh, us census so the location of each hole represented a specific piece of information whether it is male or female card inserted into a machine and metal pins okay these metal pins tries to complete the circuit used to open and close the electrical circuit if the circuit was closed a computation was increased by one otherwise uh, there is no change population count now after herman holrich's punch card it took only 6 weeks to count 63 million and before that it was uh, means it takes 10 years okay so this is the greatness of this tabulating machine so let me show you tabulating machine the following video is produced by the computer history archives project dedicated to in this video we take a high level view of the world of computer punch cards most people today are not familiar with computer punch cards used in very large computer systems except perhaps as seen in very old movies such as the billion dollar brain in 1967 most punch card computers have long since been replaced but a few still exist and operate some are in museum collections a fascinating element in the history of computing is the role played by punch cards and the wide variety of uses they provided by the early 1960s Historically, punched cards as a method of controlling the actions of early textile machines goes back to the 18th century. There were a number of early pioneers in this field. For the purposes of this video, we will mention four of the most notable: Joseph Marie Jacquard, Charles Babbage, Herman Hollerith, and James L. Powers. Joseph Marie Jacquard. Born in 1752, improved on earlier techniques of using punched cards to program the textile machines that performed the mechanical weaving. His 1805 punch card loom machine saved considerable time and labor and was widely successful. Charles Babbage, born in 1791, developed the design for an analytical engine, a general-purpose programmable computing engine. that borrowed Jacquard's idea for punch cards that provided programmed instructions. Herman Hollerith, born in 1860, developed a mechanical tabulator based on punched cards to rapidly tabulate statistics from millions of pieces of data. His machines were used to record the data from the 1890 US census. In 1896, he founded the tabulating machine company that later merged with several other companies to become the Computing Tabulating and Recording Company or CTR. In 1924, CTR was renamed International Business Machines Corporation, known by its world-famous initials IBM. James L. Powers, born in 1871, developed a tabulating machine that differed from Herman Hollerith's and was faster and more economical at the time. In 1911, Powers formed the Powers Tabulating Machine Company. He later changed the name to the Powers Accounting Machine Company for better marketing results. In 1927, Powers Accounting Machine Company merged with the Remington Typewriter Company and Rand Cardex to form Remington Rand. In 1950, Remington Rand acquired the Eckert Mockley Computer Company, designers of the Univac. 
Remington merged with Sperry in 1955 to form Sperry, Rand, and later in 1986 with Burroughs to form Unisys. Today, both IBM and Unisys are global players in information technology solutions, but share the field with many other newer and even larger players. GCS, Cognizant, Infosys, Capgemini, everything is... The success of punch card technology, as used by the U.S. Government Census Bureau, led to increased use in business applications. During the early 1900s, Remington Rand was a leader in punch card accounting for commercial applications, with IBM a close second. By 1929, however, IBM surpassed Remington Rand as the leading company in supplying machines for business and government, and was better able to survive the economic depression of 1929 and the early 1930s. IBM had switched to using 80 column cards with rectangular holes in 1928. IBM had used round holes in its cards up until that time. The now famous IBM card measured just 7 and 3 eighths by 3 and 1 quarter inches. And that size remained standard for years to come. Remington continued using round holes for many years but switched to a 90 column format in 1930. By 1940, IBM dominated about 90% of the tabulating market. It became the major supplier to the government of its accounting and later its computing technology for social security applications and military applications. Seen here in this 1946 U.S. government video, the ENIAC, the first large-scale digital electronic computer built, used IBM card readers and card punch machines. Punch cards were used both for program instructions for machines and for data input and output. The IBM punch card became the standard medium for data storage up through the 1960s. The widespread acceptance of punch card equipment helped IBM grow a large customer base, giving it an advantage as it moved into the electronic computer's age. In 1931, IBM released its Model 600 Multiplying Punch. IBM's first punch card machine that could multiply. The first calculating punch machines were electromechanical. Later models employed vacuum tube logic. Instructions were hardwired. Later, removable control circuits provided flexibility in programming, such as in the highly successful IBM 604 Electronic Calculating Punch introduced in 1948. In 1953, IBM announced the 650 Magnetic Drum Data Processing Machine, one of its early computers. In 1956, it was enhanced as the IBM 650 RAMAC system, with the addition of disk storage units. Nearly 2,000 systems were produced up until 1962. The Model 029 key punch was introduced in 1964 with the IBM System 360 mainframe system. The Model 029 was the workhorse machine for many years. Introduced with System 370 in 1971, the IBM 129 key punch machine was capable of punching, verifying, and being used as an auxiliary, online card reader, or card punch for attached computers. Here are some examples of punch cards and their various applications. Punch cards were still commonly used for data entry and programming until the mid-1980s. However, the advancement of video display terminals, interactive computing, networks, and personal computers allowed users to efficiently enter data directly into computers from the keyboard or rely on other electronic input with much higher speed and reliability.
so these are all punch cards okay let me switch to next slide ibm has uh, used one more machine based on punch cards so let us see what is the beauty of that machine because it was shown in previous slide also but this machine is uh, actually modern computing machine although there is no monitor but you can go for computing and this machine is really very specific uh, special kind of machine here you can see that one drum is there which you which is used to read the program and several other like if you want to take input because that time keyboard uh, keyboards are not there so you need to enter input punch card and you need to enter output punch card and you need to uh, provide program punch card also so these all thing makes uh, your uh, computation easy okay so let me show you this is the machine here this circular portion shows that the it is a programming uh, mach, uh, programming punch card it holds a programming punch card and several other punch cards over there so let us see the video all right it's hard to believe but i think uh, i'm done with so let's imagine we just got it in 1950 1960 punching after print on print on punch we're all good to go p there we go register out we go This keyboard is for punching on there, okay? For input, you need to use punch card for First name, last name, and here, date of uh, birth. Okay. Program mode, program one. Uh, let's do auto feed. And he is uh, also going to duplicate the cards. Go. So now we should be under Let us examine the thing. Yeah. All right. It uh, copied the first field asking for the first name. He's typing his name. Very good. And then we field. date 
uh, Sing Sing on the Thomas Watson card. So that's working fine. Uh, next feature um, that would be uh, auto duplicate. So that's another program that would be program two. Let's take uh, this one, put it over here. And I will duplicate under program control, which is much faster than manual duplicate if I do it right. Program two. Uh, two. It should have duplicated that card. Yeah, you can do the whole test, right? It's the same, the same one exactly. Uh, and then, uh, so that was the second program on the drum. Then last feature, uh, interpreting. I had prepared a beautiful card. So this is how you can I use the punch card. Here he has created a duplicate uh, That's a and mystery this is card the with no marking okay. on so the top. Uh, and skip to find out this what slide it is. because so you know the working here. of punch card now. Uh, so this is the machine mark one. So just uh, whenever you are uh, you have a free time, so just type mark one fire in 2019. Okay. So here you can see that uh, I think in November 2019 it was fired among the persons, and uh, this is a machine developed by Howard Aiken in 1900. Uh, uh, means uh, it is the time. Uh, uh, to live in Earth of Howard Aiken. So Aiken thought he could create a modern and functioning model of Babbage analytical engine. He succeeded in securing a grant of $1 million because without money, he, uh, he is not able to produce such kind of machine. So government provides a grant. For his purpose, automatic sequence calculator, the Mark 1 for short, from IBM. So IBM has granted him $1 million. In 1944, the Mark 1 was switched on. Eichel's colossal machine spanned 51 feet in length. So this length is 51 feet and the height is 8 feet. So it is around 500 meters of uh, wiring. It, it was required to connect each component. And the Mark 1 did transform Babbage's dream into reality and did succeed and uh, putting IBM's name on the forefront of the computer industry. From 1944 on, modern computers would forever be associated with digital intelligence. So this particular thing is uh, there in Harvard University, and he is Howard, Howard Aiken, and uh, it is there in So let us see. So this was punch card program. Okay. Later in 1939 and 1942, ABC computer was developed. This was first electronic computer built by Joy, uh, John Atenosoft and Clifford Barry. Computer use binary numbers. Okay, so this is the main thing based on binary because binary in in case of this only one unidirectional communication is going. Okay, so binary system is still use in use today. So without binary, you won't be able to think about computer system. Okay. So there are binary logics and this is the whole computer. This this shows the uh, punch card reader and printing machine. So this is the ABC computer which includes the walls and binary uh, logics are there and there are some other logics like power supply and regulator 3D add subtract logic. So this will come in your digital electronic subject. Elect 
electrical punch uh, card punching circuit. So here it is electrical card punching circuit is given and memory regenerating circuit. This also you are going to read in digital electronics. OK, and it all follows the binary logic like base to output card puncher base to card reader. So base to we are going to uh, do calculation related with 2s complement. OK, so this is your two, base 2. Base 2 means binary. Fine. Similarly, decimal to binary conversion drum. So this drum is uh, going to calculate decimal to binary. Then this is the keyboard drum. Actually, that time we don't have any provision to write program using key, uh, keyboard. And if keyboards are there, they are just used for punching the cards. So this was developed by Atenas of Clifford Barry. That's why it is uh, known as ACB. Actually, it was initially ACB, but later on, because of uh, pronunciation dilemma and some other things, people used to say this as ABC computer. OK. So uh, then come to. So this was electronic numerical integrator and computer. You can see that this is very big computer inside that computer. The persons are working fine. So this is a machine that computes at speed of 100 times faster than the Mark 1. So here this is our Mark 1 and after this Mark 1, this computer was able to compute at the speed of 100 times faster than Mark 1. It was capable of only two years earlier. OK, using 1800, 19, 1800 to 19,000, actually 18,000 to 19,000 vacuum tubes. So here so many vacuum tubes are installed. OK. And 70,000 registered that time register is not like uh, whatever we are using very tiny devices, but uh, that time it was very big, big thing and 5 million soldered joints. So 5 million soldered joints are there and it was massive instrument acquired the output of small power station. So it requires a small output of a small power station. Uh, this was the disadvantage, but it, it gives a new direction to uh, create your own computer. OK, and which is very efficient now a thousand times is very, very high speed. You can think about it. It could do nuclear physics calculation in two hours. OK, in two hours nuclear physics calculation. Now it is able to do and which it would take uh, 100 engineers simultaneously and one years to calculate means thousand years it is required by hand and it will be able to compute within two hours. The systems program could be changed by re uh, rewiring a panel. Actually, we need to rewire the panel. Now what is micro? Actually, there is hardwired control. So this is hardwired control. Changing on wiring will change the program. And in case of micro program control, you need to change the sequence of program, whatever we are writing in C and assembly language. So this is coming under micro program sort of thing. Its weight is around 30 tons and it was 1500 square feet average area of three bedroom house. So you can see that very big area it requires fine. So this is ENIAC and you see and you can enjoy that how ENIAC is working and oh, what are the different uh, elements like vacuum tube. Actually vacuum tube is uh, the first uh, wall which uses unidirectional communication. So here you can see how. In February 1946, the U.S. government revealed to the public the existence of a secret computer, which had been developed under the code name Project PX. The computer was called ENIAC, a massive electronic digital computer. Begun in 1943, under the authority of the U.S. Army, the ENIAC was developed at the Moore School of Electrical Engineering at the University of Pennsylvania. The following film is perhaps one of the earliest existing video records of a fully operational electronic digital computer ever made. This originally silent film has been carefully edited to remove lighting imperfections and other issues present in the original. In all other respects, it contains 100% of the original film footage and is provided here for historical purposes. ENIAC stands for Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer. 
It was the world's first large-scale digital electronic general-purpose computer. It was designed to be capable of being reprogrammed to solve a large number of numerical problems. ENIAC was conceived and designed by John Mockley and J. Presper Eckert of the University of Pennsylvania. They headed up a team of engineers and others that worked on the ENIAC project, which begun in 1943. The team that worked on the ENIAC included a large number of women who were instrumental in the detailed task of manually programming this giant machine. Programming was accomplished by setting switches and connecting wires according to specific instructions, which were first worked out on paper and then carefully carried out and tested. Mapping the program out on paper took weeks. The task of setting the switches and wiring cables to match the program diagram then took many days to complete. When it was originally designed, there was no written manual on how to program the ENIAC. The women involved in the actual programming of the machine relied on block diagrams and logic diagrams of the machine's operation, as well as personal talks with the engineers directly responsible for specific parts of the ENIAC machine. In 1997, the six women who did most of the programming of ENIAC were inducted into the Women in Technology International Hall of Fame. In addition to switch panels and wiring panels, ENIAC used an IBM punch card reader for input and an IBM card punch machine for data output. The timing of these machines was synchronized with the operation of the ENIAC itself. The ENIAC was a very large machine. It weighed over 30 tons. The ENIAC had a total of 40 panels and utilized 18,000 vacuum tubes with 70,000 resistors and 10,000 capacitors. ENIAC also had its own dedicated power line. To keep the vacuum tubes from overheating, the room was air-cooled. When ENIAC was announced in 1946, the news media called it a giant brain. Its computing speed was 1,000 times greater than that of electromechanical machines. This computational power, along with its general-purpose programmability, made it a technical marvel of its time. ENIAC's design and construction was financed by the United States Army. The construction contract was signed on June 5, 1943, and work on the computer began the following month. The cost of the ENIAC in 1946 was just under $500,000, which is equivalent to over $6 million today. ENIAC was formally accepted by the U.S. Army in July 1946. ENIAC was temporarily shut down on November 9, 1946 for a refurbishment and a memory upgrade. It was then transferred to Aberdeen Proving Ground, Maryland, in 1947. There, on July 29, 1947, it was turned on and remained in continuous operation until it was powered down on October 2nd, 1955. ...to calculate artillery firing tables for the United States Army's Ballistic Research Laboratory. A typical ballistics calculation that previously might have taken 12 hours using a desktop mechanical calculator could now be done in just 30 seconds. The ENIAC's other applications included weather prediction, atomic energy calculations, cosmic ray studies, thermal ignition, random number studies, wind tunnel design, and other scientific uses. Here, output from one of ENIAC's printers is being produced. In this scene, we see brilliant ENIAC designers J. Presper Eckert on the left and John Mockley on the right. They would continue their involvement in computer design and manufacture far beyond ENIAC in the years to come. Even before ENIAC was fully operational, 
both Eckert and Mockley realized they could design and build a significantly more capable and efficient computer, incorporating some design improvements. They began working on a computer they called the EDVAC. EDVAC was delivered to the U.S. Army's Ballistics Research Laboratory in 1949 and made fully operational by 1951. In 1946, the University of Pennsylvania adopted a new patent policy, which would have required Eckert and Mockley to assign all their patents to the university if they stayed beyond March. Unable to reach agreement with the university, both Eckert and Mockley left the Moore School in March 1946, along with many of the senior engineering staff. Soon afterwards, Eckert and Mockley started up the Electronic Control Company. They later changed the name to the Eckert Mockley Computer Corporation, or EMCC. By October 9, 1947, they had a contract with Northrop Aircraft to build the BINAC, or Binary Automatic Computer. EMCC was officially incorporated in December 1947 and was the first commercial computer company founded specifically to produce electronic digital computers. The EMCC had also been working on another computer, the UNIVAC. Before the UNIVAC was completed, Remington Rand purchased EMCC, which then became the UNIVAC division of Remington Rand. UNIVAC 1 was released in 1951. In 1955, Sperry merged with Remington Rand, and the name Sperry Univac was used on many computers until Sperry dropped the name Univac in 1984. Sperry merged with Burroughs in 1986, and that company became Unisys. At the University of Pennsylvania, other components of ENIAC reside at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California, and other locations. ENIAC remains a milestone in computer development. The brilliant work of Eckert, Mockley, and the many men and women who contributed to this amazing industry is a legacy that lives on to this day. So, I think uh, there is no problem. So this is all about vacuum tube and it is installed in a computer and we need to refresh every uh, few minutes. OK, in within one or two uh, hours or minute, we need to change the vacuum tubes because heat dissipations are there. So let us see uh, vacuum tube. Let's get inside. It. In fundamental operation, it resembles an ordinary single pole switch. A switch that can connect, for instance, this battery and its motor load. One power lead comes to the anode, the other lead goes to the cathode. When this switch is open, the contacts are insulated from each other by a vacuum or by some inert gas inserted into an evacuated tube under low pressure. To close this switch electronically, all we need to do is heat the cathode. and give the anode a positive potential. Then here's what happens. As electrons are emitted from the surface of the heated cathode, being negatively charged, they fly at tremendous speed to the anode. In this way, a current carrying path is formed, which closes our electronic switch and permits our motor to operate. You'll notice, by the way, that the direction of electron flow is contrary to the orthodox concept of current flow from plus to minus. In the first place, we can rectify current with it, converting AC to DC. We can do this merely by connecting an electronic tube in series with an AC circuit. As you study this circuit diagram, note that only each positive half wave of AC voltage will now produce a current. When the anode is negative, the electrons are repelled and no current flows. 
In other words, because only the cathode can emit electrons, we have here what amounts to a one-way street. We can visualize the result of the tube's rectifying action with the aid of these two oscilloscopes. The one on the left shows alternating currents coming in. So this shows only unidirectional uh, flow of uh, electron. On the right shows okay. pulsating direct current going During out. first half, it is showing the That's result. The and so this basic rectifying principle are many yes. and important. The second basic thing we can do with it is amplify. Here's how. Between the cathode and the anode, the two elements of the tube, which we diagrammed a while ago, we now place a grid. To this grid, we connect an input of some weak voltage which we wish to amplify, perhaps that of a faint radio signal from halfway around the world. Now let's see what happens. Every time a negative potential is impressed on the grid, even though it be very minute, it has a large effect in reducing the number of the negatively charged electrons which would otherwise keep flying from cathode to anode. Conversely, when the grid is positive, an equally large effect is exerted in increasing the flow of electrons from cathode to anode. The important thing to note here is this. A small amount of power applied at the grid is amplified into a large amount of power in the anode or work circuit. This amplifying property of the three-element electronic tube is put to work in innumerable ways. So this is all about vacuum tubes, okay? And in 1930s, 1940s, Allen Turing developed universal uh, universal machine. An earlier machine was uh, uh, already seen by you that it tells that we need to change wiring for a programming. But he envisioned a computer that could perform any different uh, task by simply changing a program rather than by changing the electronic component. OK, so he was Alan Turing, father of modern computing. Now, later in 1945, John von Neumann has uh, developed one model known as stored programming model or stored uh, programming organization. OK, stored program organization. OK, actually, because we are in uh, modern era, so we know that input devices are there, output devices are there, memory unit is also there. But before that, it was not. Uh, memory unit was not there. So he has developed a concept of a stored program and the program would be stored in central processing unit. OK, so this central processing unit consists of control unit and arithmetic and logical unit. This control unit is very si uh, similar to your pulses. OK, hard pulses. If hard pulses are there, then only you will be able to synchronize your devices means your whole uh, body. If hard pulse is not there, you uh, won't be able to synchronize yourself. OK, sometimes when blood pressure increases or uh, downs, then automatically some other things may happen. So uh, that's why this is a central par a part or uh, important part of uh, this uh, whole uh, programming. Otherwise, what happen if you are going to calculate certain thing? If it is not synchronized, then answer will be wrong. So he has simply given one concept of memory unit is there inside this central processing unit logic and it stores the program and we can use this program later on to calculate uh, different uh, input and output. OK, so this is John von Neumann's uh, model for uh, uh, stored program. Later in 1947 uh, in the laboratories of Bell Telephone, John uh, Bardeen and uh, Bratton and William Shockley discovered the transfer registers. Modern okay. computers are revolutionizing our lives, performing tasks unimaginable only decades ago. This was made possible by a long series of innovations, but there's one foundational invention that almost everything else relies upon, the transistor. So what is that? And how does such a device enable all the amazing things computers can do? Well, at their core, all computers are just what the name implies. 
machines that perform mathematical operations. The earliest computers were manual counting devices, like the abacus, while later ones used mechanical parts. What made them computers was having a way to represent numbers and a system for manipulating them. Electronic computers work the same way, but instead of physical arrangements, the numbers are represented by electric voltages. Most such computers use a type of math called Boolean logic that has only two possible values, the logical conditions true and false, denoted by binary digits one and zero. They are represented by high and low voltages. Equations are implemented via logic gate circuits that produce an output of one or zero based on whether the inputs satisfy a certain logical statement. These circuits perform three fundamental logical operations, conjunction, disjunction, and negation. The way conjunction works is an AND gate provides a high voltage output only if it receives two high voltage inputs and the other gates work by similar principles. Circuits can be combined to perform complex operations like addition and subtraction, and computer programs consist of instructions for electronically performing these operations. This kind of system needs a reliable and accurate method for controlling electric current. Early electronic computers like the ENIAC used a device called the vacuum tube. Its early form, the diode, consisted of two electrodes in an evacuated glass container. Applying a voltage to the cathode makes it heat up and release electrons. If the anode is at a slightly higher positive potential, the electrons are attracted to it, completing the circuit. This unidirectional current flow could be controlled by varying the voltage to the cathode, which makes it release more or less electrons. The next stage was the triode, which uses a third electrode called the grid. This is a wire screen between the cathode and anode through which electrons could pass. Varying its voltage makes it either repel or attract the electrons emitted by the cathode, thus enabling fast current switching. The ability to amplify signals also made the triode crucial for radio and long distance communication. But despite these advancements, vacuum tubes were unreliable and bulky. With 18,000 triodes, ENIAC was nearly the size of a tennis court and weighed 30 tons. Tubes failed every other day, and in one hour, it consumed the amount of electricity used by 15 homes in a day. The solution was the transistor. Instead of electrodes, it uses a semiconductor like silicon, treated with different elements to create an electron-emitting N-type and an electron-absorbing P-type. These are arranged in three alternating layers, with a terminal at each, the emitter, the base, and the collector. In this typical NPN transistor, due to certain phenomena at the PN interface, a special region called a PN junction forms between the emitter and base. It only conducts electricity when a voltage exceeding a certain threshold is applied. Otherwise, it remains switched off. In this way, small variations in the input voltage can be used to quickly switch between high and low output currents. The advantage of the transistor lies in its efficiency and compactness. Because they don't require heating, they're more durable and use less power. ENIAC's functionality can now be surpassed by a single, fingernail-sized microchip containing billions of transistors. At trillions of calculations per second, today's computers may seem like they're performing miracles. But underneath it all, each individual operation is still as simple as the flick of a switch. So, uh, this was a transistor. An advantage, increase reliability, consume 120 of the uh, electricity of vacuum tubes, uh, where fraction of cost. This tiny devices had a huge impact on and uh, extensive implication for modern computer. In 1956, the transistor won its creators Nobel Prize, Nobel Peace Prize for their invention. OK, so uh, so this is from vacuum tube. This is vacuum tube diode valves. OK, and uh, this is your uh, transistor. So traditional transistors and this is uh, transistor radio based on transistor. So sometimes uh, the people uh, uh, use the word transistor synonymously to the uh, radio. OK, so the 
Miniaturization of computer began with the invention of transistor on December 23rd, 1947 by William Shockley, John Bardeen and Walter Bardeen at Bell Laboratories. Early computers like Enya contained thousands of vacuum tubes, millions of solder joints and consumed hundreds of kilowatts of electricity. Transistors would replace the tubes, greatly reduce the heat output and space requirement. OK, so let us now see the first computer bug. Actually, it was a uh, bug found in their program. Fine. And the term debug and bugging was there uh, in. Uh, I will show you the history also in a letter on. So let us see uh, that time when we are going to write a program. OK, when we are going to write a program, it was started from one, two, three, four, five, six. These are the columns and that's why this uh, square sheets are there. So when we put this instruction from this place, so it will automatically um, uh, showing some error and warning. So that's why and because due to this bug and it was found in uh, their program. So whenever uh, 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 things like a program is erroneous or due to this error, the program is executed, but it will not give you correct output. So such kind of thing is known as bug. And if we remove this kind of bugs, uh, means this kind of uh, programming bug, then it will uh, known as debug. Debugging. OK, this process is debugging. So Grace Hopper was there who has uh, coined the term bug. Actually, before this also bug was there. I will show you in uh, uh, C programming. OK. Then come to Altair 1975. So let me. Uh, uh, OK, fine. Altair 1975, there are three more computers. So the invention of transistor made computers smaller, cheaper and more reliable. Therefore, the stage was set for uh, the entrance of computer into domestic realm. In 1975, the age of personal computer com uh, commenced. So uh, because uh, some noise is coming, so let me. Uh, means I am uh, muting myself because of this noise. OK. So now uh, the noise is gone. Let me start once again. So yeah, now my voice is there. Fine. So Altair 1975, it was first uh, computer, first digital computer, but without uh, keyboard and uh, video display and storage device. So you need to purchase this. Fine. Under the leadership of Ad Robert and micro instrumentation and telemetry company MITS wanted to design a computer kit for home hobbies. Based on Intel 8080 processor, it is 8 bit processor capable of uh, controlling 64 kilobyte of memory. The mid Altair as the uh, invention was later called was doubted, uh, not doubted, debuted on the cover of January edition of popular electronic magazine. And this was uh, actually this was uh, uh, approved by Bill Gates also presenting the Altair as an unassembled kit capped cost to minimum. Therefore, the company was able to offer this model for only $3.95. OK, supply could not keep up with demand because uh, demand is very high and the supply was not that much high. OK, so this is the device. Uh, this is the model device and this is actual device Altair 8800 computer. So it was not coming with uh, keyboard, video display and storage devices. We need to purchase this and it will automatically work uh, fine. 19, in 1970s, uh, John Huff transistors were replaced by integrated circuit or chip, giving computers tremendous speed to process information at a rate of million of computation per second, and it is also known as MIPS. Okay. 
billion instruction per second. So MIPS computers are there. In 1970s, John Hub invented the microprocessor and entire CPU on a single chip. It means what is the microprocessor? Actually, microprocessor integrates the power of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, as well as some other powers like logics. Okay, so this was integrated in single chip and it will become microprocessor. It also integrated with cache memory and uh, uh, you know registers. All these things are uh, integrated in a single chip. That's why it becomes microprocessor, mu p. Okay. This allowed for building uh, of a microprocessor, or a microcomputer, or personal computer. IBM PC was developed in 1981 on August 12. IBM announced its own personal computer using 16-bit Intel 8080. Actually, 8085, 8085, and 8080. These are 8-bit computer, okay? Nowadays, we are using 64-bit, okay? Whenever we are going to purchase the computer, we just need to see 64-bit. Even programs uh, with 32-bit uh, capability is not capable of running under 64-bit processors. Even my our uh, mobile phones are also 64-bit. But that time it was 8-bit, and later in 1981, 8080-88 and 8086. These two computers are 16 bit. OK, so they use 16 bit uh, uh, Intel 8080 microprocessor allowed for increased speed and huge amount of memory. Unlike the Altair that was sold as unassembled computer kit, IBM sold it ready made machine kit. It means that CPU is there. CPU means it is it, it included motherboard and all other things with monitor and keyboards so keyboard and monitors are there alongside this cpu so this was a ready-made machine through retailers and by qualified sales people because we need to explain how to use computer to satisfy consumers appetites and to increase usability ibm gave prototype ibm pcs to a number of major software companies for the first time why we need a prototype because it is based on assembly code okay so assembly code requires their manual, fine. So assembly manual must be there. And on this assembly manual, you can run your program by writing uh, mnemonics, okay? For the first time, small companies and individuals who never would have imagined owning a personal computer were now open to computer world. Later on, 1984, Macintosh was developed. IBM's major competitor was a uh, company led by Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs. The Apple Computer Inc. The Lisa was the result of their competitive trust. OK, so Lisa. This was the first computer and later on it was named as uh, Apple. The system differed from its predecessor in its use of a mouse. Mouse uh, was also developed that time. Then a quite foreign computer instrument in lieu of manually typing commands. However, the outrageous price of Lisa kept it out of reach for many computer buyers. Apple's brainchild was the Macintosh like Lisa. Macintosh too would make use of graphical user Hi interface. Hi everyone, Knupsi here, and in this video, we're going to be going back to the past. Back to 1984 when Apple's most iconic computer was released, as well as when Stranger Things in Season 2 takes place. That's totally tubular. So in this video, we're going to be taking the original Apple Macintosh from 1984 and making it the main centerpiece of our workspace in a technology revisitation made possible by TELUS, the mobile carrier making the future friendly. Let's get started. This all starts with the computer, the Apple Macintosh from 1984, in this case the 512K, which gets its name from the amount of built-in RAM, which you can probably guess is 512 kilobytes. 
this computer in the 80s was pretty expensive for a lot of people at a price of $2,795 US, which is equivalent to $6,443 today. This was sort of the standard price for a PC back in the 80s, if not a bit cheaper, but the 512K actually had a trick up its sleeve compared to other PCs. It had a graphical user interface. Now, Apple didn't actually totally invent the whole graphical user interface for desktop computers, but made it incredibly popular and more approachable. The first main computer with a graphical user interface was the Xerox Star. However, it actually cost a lot. It was totally niche and really nobody bought it. The display screen shows your working environment. We call this the desktop. It is an electronic analog for an office. On the screens are small pictures or icons representing familiar office objects. Apple didn't actually just steal the interface from the star, but it worked with Xerox directly to build its own software version, which we now know as Mac OS. The Macintosh's external design is undeniably iconic. It's an all-in-one computer that is very compact, it's portable with an actual handle up top, it's minimal, and carefully designed in many aspects. At the front, there's a real absence of pretty much anything except for the floppy disk drive, the Apple logo, and the display, of course, which is a 9-inch black and white CRT with a resolution of 512 by 342 pixels. And the back, like today's Apple computers, is where you'll find pretty much everything else. There's the five total ports and the PRAM battery cover. away from the computer itself, for peripherals, I'm using the stock Macintosh keyboard and mouse. The keyboard provides a very, and I mean very, satisfying typing experience. And it's also hella thick too, especially compared to Apple's new Magic Keyboard. And for the trackball mouse, it has just one button up top, adding to the very minimal nature of this entire system. This all came at a time when using a mouse was sort of a foreign concept for a lot of consumers. Now, also with the system, I have my floppy disks, of course, and floppy disks with the Macintosh are used for both program access and file storage. This computer also came out at a time when email, cloud storage, and easy file transfers weren't totally easy, so we're dealing with printing and faxing a lot of stuff. So part of my setup, I also have the Apple Image Writer 2 printer. This printer came out actually a year after the 512K was released and used a process called dot matrix printing. Today we're familiar with laser or inkjet printers and they're much more advanced and quieter and faster and just generally more reliable, but I actually prefer the design of this printer. It feels much more charming and personal. It just looks a whole lot better than today's printers. I also have a few other key desk essentials here too, like this highly adjustable, very flexible task lamp for working to the late hours of the night. And next to my computer, I keep this very minimal brawn clock. And even though it's missing a piece up top, I like the clean design and the brawn clock face. And essentially, that's my setup. I find it really amazing how our phones today are able to do so many advanced things that people many years ago were only able to do on expensive pieces of tech and multiple pieces of tech. We can call, we can text, we can play games, type out essays, and I did it during class once, and trust me, it's not really as bad as it sounds, edit videos, and do pretty much everything we can just think of to do on our phones. Our devices today are more advanced and more powerful than we could ever imagine. In all honesty, looking at old technology and comparing it to new technology is one of my favorite things to do as a technology YouTuber and just as a person in general. The incredibly rapid... So, this was Apple's computer, okay? So, it was introduced in 1984 and it was an immediate success. The GUI made the system easy to use. The Apple Macintosh debuted in 1984. It features a simple graphical interface uses 8 megahertz, 32-bit Motorola 6800 uh, CPU and has built a 9-inch black and white screen. Cost is around $24.2495. You have seen already. Okay. And then Windows is coming into existence. So let me show you Windows operating system. Uh, it was also with uh, mouse and keyboards. So this was only a video available with uh, uh, for Windows 19, uh, which was uh, introduced in 1985. So how do we on the Windows system? Let us see.
so this is the system monitor keyboard and mouse is also placed but it is not shown here and this is the cpu okay so this is actually desktop cpu and um, about this cpu we will place the monitor so this is checking for the system how to start parallel port floppy disk and all other things so it is coming with dos as well as dos was the primary operating system and windows 3.1 this is the windows 3.1 operating system it was a secondary operating system so we need to install dos first then type uh, windows then automatically it will uh, open the system okay so there are very uh, small amount of programs like write.x pen.x exe uh, these are the executable files So these menus are written in your familiar language. I don't know which language, but uh, I think you know which language is this. So here it is showing that how to create agenda. Okay. So this was our windows operating system okay it was uh, coming into existence in 1985 for general people and then so uh, with this we finished our uh, introductory part of computer history okay then in uh, tomorrow we will discuss the number system different number systems like decimal binary octal hexadecimal so how do we go for these numbers and now uh, I'm recommending each and every class member to attend this class for number system because number system is very important to program everywhere. Uh, yesterday, some of you have seen that how do we store the numbers in integer format and how it shows the different memory location. So for this purpose, uh, everything uh, we need to go uh, and uh, we must know the concept of number system. This is very, very important. OK, very, very important means if you know the number system, you can do anything fine. So with this, I will close my uh, video and thank you very much for attending this. And this time, I think how many of you are there? Uh, so 40 persons are there because 40 and so I think uh, it is sufficient. Any doubt?